is a fundamental transformation of the way we work, the way people are engaged in the labour market. The change can be summarised as a movement away from a manufacturing oriented situation where most people saw themselves as being in full-time, fairly stable jobs on fixed workplaces that could be regulated by labour laws, collective bargaining and so on, where you could measure the clocking in and the clocking out eight hours a day, whatever it might be. That's gone. Today we have what I called tertiary time. Unlike manufacturing time, which was blocks, get up in the morning, went to workplace, went home in the evening, in lifetime sense, you had a few years in schooling, 30 years in jobs, short period in retirement, blocks. In the 21st century, in most societies, we're moving to tertiary time, where all forms of activity crowd into time. So you could be doing some work, which has use value but is not being paid. You could be doing some labor for which you're being paid. You could be doing a bit of leisure. You could be doing a bit of relaxation. And all of it crowds into your time. And if you're in the precariat, these are crowding into your time altogether. And the problem is that you don't know how best to allocate your time rationally. And therefore, millions of people suffer from what I've called the precariatized mind. You don't know which is best, what is best to do. Is it best to spend a bit more time networking, a bit more time doing something for the boss, a bit more time training, a bit more time queuing, a bit more time filling forms or whatever. And this is very, very insecure and stressful, particularly if a wrong decision could have disastrous implications. And I promise you that this phenomenon is very widespread and it affects a lot of people and more people are feeling it today almost every day it's growing and this tertiary time scenario goes with the fact that more and more work and more and more labor is done off workplaces outside paid labor time this is a different world and labor law as developed in the 20th century and the International Labour Organization conventions were not suited and not designed for this tertiary world. Now the precariat knows this from bitter experience and they have to do a lot of work for labor, a lot of work for the state, a lot of work for reproducing themselves and keeping up to date and things like that. And therefore, what is actually happening is that if you're in the precariat, you spend probably two, three, four times as much time doing work that is not labor. So th this has come on top of the old feminist debate, which is very important. The old feminist debate was many forms of work, care work, looking after children, relatives, family, doesn't get counted as work, okay? So if I look after your child and you pay me a small wage, it increases economic growth. It increases employment. It reduces the unemployment rate. Whereas if I look after my own child, economic growth goes down, employment goes down, the unemployment rate goes up. Well, this is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. But this is the, the outcome of a laborist orientation of the 20th century. And we should have got out of it a long time ago. And unless we do, I think we're going to continue to measure growth in a bad way. If you measure growth only in labor and what people doing in paid jobs, then you have to orient to increase paid labor, paid jobs, etc., which are resource depleting. 
They're affecting the environment negatively. They're crowding into our time for ourselves and our personal development. But if you change the concept of work to include care work, all the sorts of work that the precariat have to do, you would measure growth in a totally different way. And very almost overnight, you'd increase economic growth, which is, which is partly stupid because it's a problem of our statistics and our concepts. But partly it would, it would lead, lead people to focus on things that we want to do and need to do. And I think that's so crucial at this stage. I think we're going to face reality for some considerable time that the rhetoric of growth is very difficult to beat. I was addressing the Green Party conference in Harrogate last year and I said, look, I have sympathy with the term degrowth. I have sympathy with needing to reorient our activities to preserve resources, preserve the commons and so on. But you can't expect to go on doorsteps trying to get people to vote for you when you're saying degrowth, <laughs> which would be lowering living standards. Now, this is a contradiction. It's an awkward contradiction. I think it'd be far easier if people with green persuasions and people on the left started to be realistic about what is work. And if we reconceptualized and demanded that our statistics were re reformed, then we could measure growth in a far better way and say, yeah, we do want growth, which means more people caring for the community, more people caring for their relatives, more people involved in voluntary work, in political work, which at the moment doesn't get counted. Well, of course, it should be counted. It is just as valuable as pouring the tea for a boss. Why should we say pouring a tea for a boss is somehow fantastic, economic growth, but actually doing all those activities doesn't get counted? It's, it's, it's a crazy situation, and it should be possible to shame the establishment into having a new set of statistical indicators and, and measuring work in, in better ways. Because every feminist should be pushing for that. Everybody in the precariat should be pushing for that. For the, at the moment, we're in a, in, a, in a zone of stupidity, but it could be changed. I think politicians, uh, in the main, have spaghetti backbones. And they don't really lead. They respond to pressure. And I think we're seeing the beginnings of a response to pressure, both on the left and on the right. It's more needed at this moment on the left. We have seen the end of an era of social democracy. What Pepe Grillo said, I think is correct. The, he didn't say it specifically of social democrats, but for me, the old social democrats are dead men walking. And we need a new progressive politics. And a progressive politics which says that everybody needs basic security. We need a redistributive agenda. We need a new income distribution system. We need an environmentally oriented social policy. We need to rescue the commons. We need new forms of agency. These are all things that people traditionally on the progressive side of politics have said, yeah, these are part of the Enlightenment values. But we've lost in the last 30 years, not we necessarily, but it has been lost, the capacity to forge a realistic vision of a good society. And why we're celebrating Hannah Arendt is that she was writing and working in and after the Second World War. She was very aware of the dangers of totalitarianism, of course, very aware of this wonderful phrase, the need for the right to have rights, the essence of freedom, the essence of a good society. And she, in her great book, The Human Condition, 
She tried to differentiate historically uh, the difference between work, labour and action. I think she didn't get it quite right. It's different from the way I would put it. But the important breakthrough that she made in that book was to say such distinctions are necessary, are essential. And I, I think we're at such a moment now where we, we need to revive the Enlightenment values from the perspective of the precariat because no progressive politics emerges unless it is based on class. And that's not going to change in the 21st century in any more than any previous century. The emerging mass class is the precariat. It's split at the moment, but you're seeing new movements emerging, you're seeing new vocabulary emerging, new energies emerging, and as I was trying to say in this morning's session, I think there are reasons for optimism, even if there's a lot of pessimism around. Personal debt is part of rentier capitalism. It grew dramatically and systemically in the latter part of the last century. It was the outcome of the neoliberal phase of globalization the outcome of what I've called the Faustian bargain, where wages were actually falling, but had they been allowed to fall dramatically as they were under pressure to fall, there would have been social upheaval. Okay? So governments, including social democratic governments, Christian democrat governments, republican governments, essentially propped up the declining real wages with tax credits, with subsidies and with various other mechanisms, tax cuts. But that could only last for a certain amount of time because everybody was watching as millions of people were on the edge of unsustainable debt. One error, one illness, one accident, and they could be out in the streets. I've used the, the metaphor of the bag lady, a woman who wakes up in the middle of the night screaming because she's fearful that something could happen and she's out in the street with all her belongings in two plastic bags. Millions of people have those nightmares of some sort like that. And you think, we're in the 21st century. We're living in societies that are richer than in any time in human history. And we are subjecting millions of our fellow citizens to a life like this, it, 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 it's crazy. And I think the, the precariat, the energies are being revived and we are seeing the beginnings of this, this movement that I, I really feel this conference should be addressing. I think the conference has enough exciting people here intellectuals from many countries, activists, people who have, many people who are here, and I can speak a bit for myself in this regard, have felt for a very long time that we were excommunicated. We were the marginals. I'm an economist and for many years of my career, I felt like I'm excommunicated from my own community. My economics was not recognized as mainstream. Fringe, basically. Fringe, yeah. not just fringe, but actually pushed out. So you wouldn't get recognized for prizes, for uh, recognition, for promotions, for blah, blah, blah. Okay? Now, I've seen that myself, and I've seen it with a lot of others. And I think this conference is a reflection of a deep intellectual change that's taking place, and the political one that's taking place to a lesser extent, but to, to some extent. And, and I think the sort of people that are coming to this summit, and I hope it continues in, in, to build on what has started magnificently, are the type of people who are, they may not have the correct answers, but they're asking the correct questions more often than not, and many of them have the nucleus of, of a new set of ideas. It's precisely what we need in this phase of darkness and, and misery and insecurity. 
So I think the the atmosphere here is 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 palpably enjoyable. It's fun, and there's nothing wrong with that. Anyone who thinks that uh, an intellectual gathering should be all seriousness and uh, heavy references and things like that should go and take a running jump. All my professional life, I've been advocating that we should move towards a society where every person has basic income security. What this means is you give every man, every woman, and every child to a smaller amount, a regular amount that in extremis they could use on which to survive. It should be unconditional, it should be individual, not paid by a family unit or household unit. So every woman, every man should receive a basic income. It wouldn't have to be very big in, in sum, in total, to make a difference. And there is no ideal amount. But any move towards everybody having basic income security is going to have positive advantages. For many years, when I spoke about a basic income, and we formed our basic income European network, which has now become the Earth Network, Bien, uh, 30 years ago or so, we've been working on it with all the empirical studies, all the theoretical studies, and so on, all the pilots we've been through. For a long time, we were regarded as mad, bad, and dangerous to know, a classic statement. But in the last five years, suddenly we've become almost respectable, okay? And now there is hardly a day goes by without some new prominent person, intellectual, scientists, social scientists, politicians, entrepreneurs. Hillary Clinton confessed in her book that she wished she'd raised it in, the, in her presidential campaign. And a lot of people, are beginning to either advocate it or say we've got to treat it seriously. The irony is that the worst opponents, and they have an emotional vehemence that I find distressing, are old social democrats. They're old people who classified themselves as on the left. Trade union leaders, Labour Party people, social democrats, the older generation. and. It, the hostility is extraordinary because what we're talking about is giving everybody just the minimum to feel secure in their lives. What can be so bad about that, right? And they, they have all sorts of supplementary reasons. But you scratch the surface and I don't think they trust people. I don't think they have faith in people to be able to make decisions for themselves. They feel that they have to be paternalistic and the state has to be a welfare state looking after vulnerable people because we, the experts, know what they need. That sort of patronising at attitude goes very much with the old-style breadwinner type of model, the masculinity model that is still there. Now, any feminist understands that, I hope, but ecologically, too, you say, well, wait a minute, a basic income would enable people to spend more time doing activities that would help preserve the resources, caring for people, not depleting resources, as in labour and jobs and, and manufacturing and things, but doing activities in and around the family, in and around the community, helping to look after the woodlands, helping to look after the community. These are activities that make a good society, damn it. And I think a basic income is something the precariat understands. Not the old-style laborist variety who've just fallen out of working-class communities, but the new part of the precariat who've come through college and university, who are activists in various ways, are artists. They understand why we need a basic income. 
We can afford it. There's, in my book, I've argued that we can afford it in various ways. And contrary to a prejudice, and it is a prejudice because they don't have any evidence, contrary to the pre prejudice that if you and I had a basic income, £100 a week or whatever it might be, we would suddenly all become lazy and sit around not working, is a fundamental insult to the human condition. Because 99.9% .9 of us want to improve our lives from where we start today. We want to have better lives for our children, for our loved ones, for our community, for our neighbours. And that sense of wanting to improve life would be enhanced if you have basic security because with basic security you can take longer term, more strategic decisions about what you want to do. You can also take slightly more risks in how you adopt. You can also have a greater ability to say the key word, no. No to an abusive relationship. I'm walking out of here without fear that you're going to be penniless the day after. No to an abusive employer because you're so fearful that you have to hang on to that lousy job. No to a bureaucrat who's using the threat of sanctions over you. No, I will not put up with that. And I think we need to rescue freedom from a very dystopian end game of the welfare state. Many of the people here are lawyers, are in the legal professions. And I say to them, I wish more of them would focus on the fundamental illegality of social policy as it's developed in all the countries represented here. If you impose conditionalities, if you impose behaviour tests, and you are a little bureaucrat who's probably just come out of school or whatever, and you're sitting there and a client you don't like the look of, you can take it away without any due process. That's the reality today. And it's happening to hundreds of thousands of people, and I use that term without exaggeration, hundreds of thousands of people in this country who are being sanctioned and being refused entitlements on the word of some bureaucrat who's making profit out of the fact that they're saving money because their firm is handling it. And they pay no price for making wrong errors. Huge number of people have managed to find the courage and have somebody support them to appeal to what's been done to them. And if the overwhelmingly they've won their appeals. But huge numbers don't appeal because they're too frightened and stigmatized and they think that in future they may need favors done to them so they shut up and walk away or they commit suicide. We have a, we have a terrible existential crisis and it's not a minimal one, it is a, it is a contagion. And you're going to see it getting worse with universal credit in this country. You're going to see it getting worse this year. The housing problems, the homelessness, the rough sleeping. Go in any street in any town in England and you will see people begging. That's a rich, modern, 21st century society. It's inexcusable. It's inexcusable. And it's even more inexcusable if any of us shut up. That was one of the key points about Hannah Arendt's writing, the banality of evil, the banality of evil. Every little step is, you can justify. I don't have the time, I don't have the energy, I've got to do this, so, you know, it's very bad, but banality of evil. Freedom is a left argument that has been lost in the last hundred years. It's inexcusable that it was lost. The left gave too little attention to liberty, and too much attention to its version of equality, whereas the right abhorred equality and focused on the vacuum of freedom. I think their version of freedom 
is fundamentally a libertarian version, as I've discussed in my books, which is contrary to the freedom that Hannah Arendt would have supported. And the freedom that she mentioned, which is very powerful, is the freedom to act in concert. The freedom to act collectively for social and collective goals. And that freedom, of course, is anathema to the political right. Milton Friedman and the others, when they developed the neoliberalism in the 1980s, their number one target were all institutions of social solidarity because those institutions stood against the market. They stood against atomized competition, competitiveness and so on and had to go. For me, if you sacrifice your institutions and mechanisms of social solidarity, your vulnerable become intolerably vulnerable and your powerful become intolerably powerful. And that is precisely what we've been seeing. We don't have adequate agency and voice for progressive forces. What we've had, in fact, is the remnants of the old social democratic model clinging on with their old agenda, but becoming more and more ineffectual in, in defending that old agenda, but lashing out at everything else. And in a sense, you can use the, the metaphor of clearing the decks. We have been in the phase in the last few years of still needing to clear the decks of old illusions before we can rebuild the progressive agenda. They are today's reactionaries. They are, to, they are reacting to things rather than forging a good society. That's why you will find they've, heart, they've scarcely opposed things like universal credit. They've scarcely opposed the bedroom tax. They've scarcely opposed all the chipping away of the entitlements and rights of the precariat. And this is not unique to Britain. It's You'll find it in, in many other countries. And I, I think the great thing is, I come back to this point about the precariat, many people in the precariat know this. And the big thing that's happened since the Occupy movements and things in 2011, I always say this, is that instead of looking in the mirror, if they had a mirror, and seeing a failure, they're now looking in a mirror and saying, I am one of a huge army of people in the same situation and we are we and that's a huge change that's taken place in the last six seven years and i th think that is why more and more the conversations are within precarious groups within new movements and they're forging a new vocabulary and a new set of priorities I, I spent quite a lot of time in Italy and five years ago, if you would have said that the, the uh, Democrat Party, the, the party of the left of centre, social democrats as they really are, would go from having the prime minister to being way down, out completely, and the movement of Cinque Stelle, the, the precariat type movement, to win the general election. This is, this is mind-boggling how quick it's been. The same with Podemos in Spain, how it's broken the mould in Spain. You, in other countries you're seeing it. Who would have said that a Jeremy Corbyn could become the leader of the Labour Party five, ten years ago? I mean, it would have, been, it's, it would have just been inconceivable. And it's, it's fantastic because we need to break the mould. None of us are naive enough, I hope, to think that that means everything is suddenly perfect. Of course not, because changing the mold is a messy business. And, and it's too easy for too many liberals, I use the term liberal in the, in the American sense, too many people who claim to be on the left to be so critical of any defect of the new movements that they reject them altogether. I think that is intellectually and politically irresponsible. 
And, and I think what one should be doing is engaging with these new movements, encouraging the new movements, and, and being involved, and starting to help, if we can, in refining the agenda. And I say this to my lawyer friends. They have a huge responsibility in this regard. They've been the recipients of too much of the rental income in the last 20 years. Too many of them are well buttered, uh, too well buttered, and it shows. But the young legal professionals, many of whom are going into the precariat, many of them understand the precariat, and I'm encouraged because I think that they are going to be playing a very positive role in forging this new progressive agenda. I think we're in a fascinating phase as far as the basic income debate is concerned. I've written a book trying to summarize all the arguments, the evidence on the subject and I believe that it's justified on grounds of social justice, on enhancement of freedom, and by giving people basic security. Basic security is a public good. What we call a public good in economics is that if you have basic security, it does not deprive me of having basic security. It's unlike other goods. So in actual fact, it's a good the more of us have basic security, the more value it gets collectively. Basic income would give basic security. So those three reasons are fundamental. But legitimizing basic income is also requiring, unfortunately or fortunately, more evidence. And what we've been doing is designing and implementing pilots. And I'm very privileged to have had the opportunities to implement a policy that I've been advocating for many, many years. It doesn't happen to many people, so I'm extremely privileged that that is the case. So you actually put it into test. To do that, of course, you have to be intellectually honest, which is to say you must allow the evidence to come through and speak for itself and not set it up in such a way that it's going to be favorable. So we've done a randomized control trial. So you compare by giving 6,000 people basic income compared what happened to 6,000 people, similar people in similar communities, other communities, who were not receiving basic income. And we got independent people to collect the data with a survey instrument. So we have millions of digits of information, millions, okay? And we saw in the pilots in India that relative to the people not receiving the basic income and relative to their own past, huge improvements in nutrition, huge improvements in health. People had fewer illnesses, fewer crises, huge improvements in school attendance and performance. Big increase in work and economic activity, particularly by women. Huge improvements in the relative circumstances of the most disadvantaged in those communities. So the people who benefited most were people with disabilities. Suddenly they counted. They had their own basic income. And it meant an enormous amount for them in terms of their autonomy, their dignity, their capacity to be an individual. And we saw also a sense of social solidarity. So in some of the communities, new forms of economic cooperatives developed. People pulled some of their money to buy some equipment or do something. And the community came together. All of these things we documented in a book, we've documented in videos, and we've seen similar results in Africa where we've done a pilot, and we're seeing similar results, I think, in other pilots that I've summarized. We don't need more pilots, but I think they're helping. They're helping debunking prejudices. In India, people said, you're wasting the money. They'll spend it all on alcohol and, and tobacco. In actual fact, consumption of alcohol and tobacco went down, well, not up. 
And we couldn't understand that, but it turned out that many of the men were out doing more work and they weren't smoking and drinking because they had more things to do. But, but you, you debunk prejudices. But the particular prejudice that helps to debunk is that if you had a basic income, people would become lazy. It's not. That's the opposite. People become more confident, more energized, more, more uh, risk-taking, and more altru altruistic and tolerant of others, and therefore more cooperative. And, and you, you, you see this. And, and you, I mean, I saw it in these villages, both in Africa and India, and you just feel like dragging some of these social democrat critiques. Get them out there and say, sit here and watch. Get real. You know, what have you got against these people having a better life? What have you got against that? Some sort of control freak, are you? And I think that leads to the final point which I made in the basic income panel this morning. The emancipatory value of a basic income is greater than the money value. Whereas all the conditional, means-tested, targeting programs of today, it's the other way around. They chip away at freedom. They limit the citizens' rights. They limit the ability to be a human being. You are a subject. You are a beggar. You are a supplicant in all but name. And you know, the wonderful thing about a basic income, and I've seen it now, I've seen it, is this emancipatory drive. It depends if I fall off my perch any day now, but if I don't, I, I'm convinced that, that within the next five years, a, a country or a, a part of a country is going to introduce it. I think it's got to the point, well, of course, we have seen it in some forms already in places like Alaska and, and various parts of, of Canada, and, and we've seen it in India. But I think within the next five years, we're going to see a government introduce it. We're talking about doing pilots in Scotland at the moment, the plans to do it in Scotland. There's a real uh, cross-party enthusiasm to do it. And I think that as soon as one country does it, as soon as one part of a country does it, you will see them all queuing up to do it too. I think what the Finnish government has done last year, it's not a real basic income, I've criticised it, they consulted me at the time, but I think it's helped because it's, it's made the subject more legitimate. The Prime Minister of Finland has come out in favour Okay, they're doing a pilot, but it's, it's very limited, it's not ideal, but I think it will help say, you don't need to have tight conditions. You don't need to tell people what to do. They want to do things to improve their lives. Believe it or not, it's part of the human condition. And, and that's a lovely phrase, and I'm so pleased that Pierre and his colleagues made it the backdrop of of this conference. And uh, I know, as was, he's a friend of mine, that this is one of the reasons why he invited me. It is rising up. It is rising up. And it's up to people like you, me, and all of us to identify, to use the terminology, to use the concepts, to use the language, to say they are not failures, they are not rejects. They are people who are going to define the good things in the future, or if, if driven the wrong way, the bad things. But they're going to be pivotal, and they're not going to be a disappearing phantom, uh, where if you just push everybody into full-time jobs, that'll be the end of the subject. That's not the answer. It's the wrong answer to the wrong question. And this is an exciting phase politically, one of the most exciting phases, I think, in the whole of my life, certainly. And I think the only thing holding us back is us. And I'm beginning to feel that us are getting up, and it's great.
it's very easy to claim that one's, one type of conference is unique and different from everything else. I'm one of those people who've been to too many conferences to, to feel that anything is unique. What I like about this summit is that it is genuinely, explicitly, an attempt to have a, a more progressive but fairly wide political spectrum uh, debate about future options. And I think that that essence of looking for future options with environmental justice, economic justice, other forms of justice driving the agenda and driving the sort of debates that are in the summit, make it potentially a fantastic vehicle for helping to forge this response. The contrast is being made with Davos. Now, for better or worse, I've been asked for two successive years to speak in Davos. And I can say that there is a wide spectrum of opinion that is represented in the Davos community. It's not the parody that some people claim. The Davos man, as it's called, is, is oversimplified. The most hostile reception of it to any speaker at this year's Davos was to Trump. There was hissing from executives from around the world, hissing as the president of the US the primary capitalist superpower. And last year there were similar negative reactions to certain type. But the Davos community is at best centrist. If with a lot of people on the right, libertarians, a lot of wealthy people speaking to wealthy people, corporations trying to attract themselves to this, that and the other, find the right vocabulary and there's a lot of that. You have to be, you have to be brutal. I think the debate with the Davos people is a debate worth having, otherwise I wouldn't have accepted it and I don't regard it as, as something uh, illegitimate. Why I think the summit here, this summit, is in a sense be a left of Davos equivalent, okay? You don't have to be many degrees left to be making a progressive agenda. But I would urge everybody who wants to support it or is inclined to, to uh, engage with the summit to say, look, we need a broad spectrum, a broad church of varieties of progressive thinking. A summit like this should not be looking for a single answer, but it should be saying that we're in the we're in the phase of opening up a debate, saying all of that right, we'll call it rentier capitalism, neoliberal, whatever, is leading us into a dystopia that's getting worse and worse. We can do better than that. The lawyers, the activists, the economists, the social scientists, and including artists and others, have all got to come together in events like this. And this is a fantastic opportunity, well-funded, well-run, with a lot of goodwill in the center of London. It's got a lot of things going for it, and one can only wish it well. It has to retain respect for its own values and not be swayed by the power of money or potential extra donors or anything which will push them around. It has to retain that integrity. And I, I'm genuinely confident, otherwise I wouldn't say this, that I think that it's well led and it's well motivated and I, I am genuinely hopeful. <laughs>